I am here with three of the best. Oh. Dominic Doan, scholar, getting his PhD at Oxford, lead pastor, Bayside Santa Rosa. Mark Clark, absolute brilliant thinker, oh. prolific author, some of the Thank best you. books. Tell us, tell us the titles of your book. Oh, uh, oh yeah, Matt, now you bring it up. Uh, <laughs> so I have a book called The Problem of God and The Problem of Jesus and coming out with a third one in February of next year. We're still working on the a title. Problem by the of problem humans. of something. Yes, we're going to be talking a lot about that. So yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, this is global, great. Better days. Let's go. Global lead pastor Bayside. One of the global pastors around here at Bayside. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Great crew. Jason Kane, you introduce yourself. Hey, Jason Kane, you have nothing nice to say about me. I appreciate uh, you know, that. No, the best, the best. They see you all the time. Uh, Save Jason, the best for Jason last. Kane, the uh, husband of Dr. Stephanie Kane. Yeah, there oh, you go. I like that. Lead like pastor, that. Bayside Blue Oaks. Church is thriving. Uh, also has a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. Just brilliant thinker. And you guys see him all the time on Better Days podcast. So today we are talking about one of the greatest questions in history. If God exists, why does he allow suffering? Mm -hmm. And I think... Opening up this question, obviously, like there's a theological element to this, but there's also a pastoral, I'm in the thick of this, life is hard, painful. We have people in our life that are connected to this reality right now. And I would love for us to have a conversation both on the theological end and on the pastoral end. And I think framing it, like, I think all of us understanding the narrative of the Bible around human suffering is so important. When God first created the world, I think six to eight times, forgot the exact number, seven. when God created the world, is it seven? Yeah. It's in between. God said, all that I've created is good. Yeah. Every time he created something, his summation, his conclusion was, it is good, tov, uh, which is this idea that everything was working within the harmony of his intention, his design, his nature. And so, when you think about the world that God created and intended, void of human suffering, how would you frame that? Yeah, I think we have to de define good because we often think of good meaning perfect. Mm -hmm. But it clearly wasn't perfect because there was a snake. Right? So where'd the snake come from? That raised a whole other set of questions. But I think one thing is clear, like it was God's original design to have a world that was full of tov, that was full of beauty and flourishing. That's how I interpret it. You would know way better than me with the Hebrew. Um, but it's a world of beauty. It's a world that reflects God's heart, a world where male and female are to live in intimate relationship with him. There's the tree of life, which they never ate of. And then you go to Revelation to your point of, it's not the world God intended, but it is the world that God will one day restore and renew. You see a garden that's recreated. You see a tree right in the middle, the tree of life. All things, are, old things are passed away. All things are made new. So I think we have to start with that premise of what God designed and what God's intent is. The end of the story, we're, in, we're living somewhere in between the two gardens. We're somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. And thus we live in this world of sorrow and chaos and war and bloodshed and heartache and depression and anxiety and doubt, all these things. Yeah. When I think of when I think of good, I think all the things you think of, but also say like good is the very nature of God. Mm -hmm. So when God created a good world, it was intended to be a reflection of Him, mm -hmm. which is void of evil and suffering and ultimately flourishing in every way. Uh, every life form, like living in harmony with the very nature of God. And I think that's just the beautiful world that we long for. Uh, when we suffer, we realize this is something amiss. Like there's something wrong. There's something in this that feels uncomfortable that isn't aligned with how our soul longs for flourishing, like longs for harmony, longs for symmetry with a design and a designer. And so I think... I think that, you know, beauty and flourishing and, and the nature of God are all wrapped up in that idea of good. Yeah. Yeah, to that point about having something in us that longs, um, it is, it's often, you know, this is one of the, it's called the rock of atheism, you know, the question of evil equals there is no God. But philosophically, as a lot of people have pointed out, it's it, the fact that you don't like the way the world is if all there was was this world, there was no transcendent 
the authoritative, objective, beauty, truth, absoluteness, you would never think that because you wouldn't have anything to compare your experience with. You would never mm -hmm. say the universe is wrong. The universe is crooked. The universe has something called suffering. It would just be the way nature is. But the fact that you say evil means there is no God, it begs the question of where you got the category of evil. So the philosophical point is as hard as this question is, which we'll talk about, the fact that we don't like the way things are is a great evidence for the existence of God, not an evidence against him. Now, how he's engaged in the evil and suffering of the world and how is he, is he present? Is he distant? Does he want things to happen? Does he allow things to happen? All of that is still something we wrestle with and struggle with and legitimately so. But I think just starting by going the fact that to your point about the longing, the fact that you have a longing, the fact that you go, things are not the way the universe is not the way it's supposed to be. It's like, what are you comparing this supposed to with? Mm. And the minute you do that, it it begs the question, maybe there is something that transcends this this natural world. Yeah. You know? In so. the words of uh, Steinbeck, we're east of Eden. Mm -hmm. um, I think Tolkien actually said something along this line, that we, we, something in us won't keep longing for Eden. Mm -hmm. And that is true whether Christian, atheist, Buddhist, a anyone has this desire for the world to be renewed and restored. And to your point, which is such, uh, such a good point and one that I've been walking through the last couple of days, because we just came from a pastor's meeting and I shared a story from our church where uh, an atheist came to church for the first time on Sunday. Right. And I asked him what brought him. He's like, well, I'm in a very difficult situation at home. And he kept using the word evil. He's like, there's something happening, right? I was a family member. And he said, the only way I know how to describe what they're doing and how they're acting is the word evil. And he said, I've never had a category for that before because I'm an atheist. Yeah. Mm. Thus, there is no such thing as evil. There are things yeah. that make you uncomfortable, but there really isn't an evil. But he's like, I'm actually facing evil, which is making me ask the question, is there a good, mm. right? And I, I think that is yeah, a, a really refreshing way, actually, to look at this question because we often frame it as this is the ultimate question against Christianity. And it is the hardest question by far, but it also, the sword cuts both ways where the fact that we see suffering points to a deeper longing yep. to get back in the garden. Yep. Every atheist longs for that too. That's why you know, there's this rallying call in our culture right now for things to be set right because we see things that are wrong. And my argument would be Christianity is the thing that gives us an explanation for those desires. So good. I love what you said about if there's evil, there has to be the opposite. Yeah. There has to be good. So then what is that good, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the question that all of us have to answer. That's the or, longing for something better. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the conversation about transcendence or like um, to use a different example, I was reading um, super conservative Baptist upbringing pastor. And he opens his his book about family and he gives this illustration. He says, if you would have asked me when I was a kid what my favorite holiday was, I would have told you it was Christmas and Easter, but I'd be lying because my real favorite holiday was Halloween. And he said, in our culture, growing up as a conservative Baptist, Halloween was not something that you celebrate. It was like bad. But the reason I liked it is because if we really believe the world is full of evil and there's a night where the where the veil between this evil world and mine thins mm. and there really is things trying to hurt me mm. isn't this something we should be talking about and then there's these two christian brothers who make uh, movies uh, the conjuring i don't know if you've ever seen the i'm not a, i'm not a horror movie guy but there's this movie called the conjuring it's super scary but, and they're christians and people are like why would you as a christian make a horror movie. And their response is, why would we make anything else? We want to make stories that are going to make people go, is there evil? Is there, are there spirits? Are we, is this versus eh, just make a movie about, Hey, we're on a roller coaster route. Like that's, why would you want to distract people from the real questions, which is if there's evil, you better, we better figure out whether we're spiritual beings or not. Fascinating that to your, like, it's like all of this raises the question of our spirituality in such an interesting way. So to go further into this story, God places Adam and Eve in the garden. Mm -hmm. Everything is good and flourishing and beautiful. And he gives them an opportunity. He mm -hmm. says, everything in the garden you can eat, you can enjoy. But this one thing 
if you eat of it, you shall surely die. The knowledge of good and evil. And a lot of people think the knowledge there is just like comprehending, understanding. It's the experiential experience yeah. of understanding good and evil. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel it. You're going to understand it, but you're going to feel it experientially, experientially in your life. Why would God give that opportunity to make that choice? That's a lot of people's question. Like why even place tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden of eden i have, I have an idea i don't i don't i don't know whether this is actually the answer um but i i think i heard this a few years ago and it always stuck in the back of my mind i don't know if i'll explain it properly but basically what that does is it creates a scenario where there can still be obedience to god mm -hmm. in a universe where there's no sin does that make sense mm -hmm. so like there's the opportunity for them to sin, but as long, the, the years that go by where they don't pick the fruit and they don't, there's still something called obedience where they chose to not do the thing God told them, but they never sinned yet, but there's still obedience where if you remove that, it's just a world where there's no obedience anymore. Yeah. So that, that might be a reason yeah. you put it there. I don't really know a, a reason beyond that. Dominic? I 100% I, I agree with that. And I think um, part of it is just the nature of the way the world is made because maybe this is rewinding a little bit, but I think it's an interesting point. Yes, when God created the world, it was good. I, I don't necessarily think perfect, but it was good. And we know it wasn't perfect in the sense of, and Augustine point, points this out, God, by virtue of creating, <laughs> he's not creating a duplicate of himself. Right, he's creating something in a, in a sense that's less than him, and maybe somehow somewhere in that space there there is room for evil to flourish. Um, I think Karl Barth called it the Das Nicht, the the night to flourish. It, it's waiting a, for the German. Yeah, it's, that, it's the absence. <laughs> right. Per conversation. Um, <laughs> so what if what if in that absence? Das Nicht. Right? Das ist nicht sehr gut. You gotta say it that way yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, but what if in that absence there is this space that's created? where now we're given opportunity to obey and it and, and it's much more authentic because we're actually presented with an option. An opportunity to disobey. And exactly. Yeah. And I think that's that's an element of like personhood. Like what does it mean to be a human being? We are volitional beings. God is a volitional being. So our opportunity to make a decision, do we want to love and worship and follow God's design for human flourishing? Or do we want to try another path? maybe our own path. And I think that what's interesting, you know, we use this term boundary in our culture today, but essentially God put a boundary. Like he said, enjoy all of this, but this will lead to consequences. You shall surely die. And a lot of people read that and they, th they think, die means physical death. I think die means so much more than physical death. I think at the, the very foundation of you shall surely die is you're gonna be disconnected from me, my authority, my design, my mm -hmm. intent for your flourishing. There's gonna be a separation of relationship and there's gonna be a separation of relationship to what I really created this world to be, a place of life and relationship yeah. and flourishing uh, as I intended it. So post that decision, you know, you have a spiritual temptation comes in to the right. scene. Uh, and there's an opportunity to obey God. No, I'm not gonna eat. God said, we will surely die. Satan cast doubt on God's word, God's person. Um, and they eat. Well, what's up with that? Like the spiritual thing that comes into play in this story. And then now they're choosing to do what's opposite of God. So. I think yeah. that's another layer to the story that people have a lot of questions about. Oh, there's so many layers. I mean, you could get into a theology of eating. It's interesting how... <laughs> yeah. it was, well, I don't know if we're going to enter into a, that, but... It's a way... But <laughs> I, no, is good. I, I think this is actually... It's an interesting <laughs> thought. So, through the act of eating, we see death and suffering enter the world. Where is that redeemed? It's at the table. Through the act of eating, we see redemption and healing. Mm. So, it's like Jesus, in a sense, is recreating what the enemy had destroyed. We also see the presence of evil at the table with Judas, the betrayer, Satan entered him. We also see the presence of evil in the garden. And in both cases, it was Eucharist, the breaking of, of God himself in this beautiful act of redemption that's bringing about renewal. So there's creation itself is a sacramental act, 
The Eucharist is a sacramental act that will one day see its flourishing in the renewal of all things. Um, why they ate um, is a whole other set of questions. Um, but I agree that- but why that, even that possibility? Why even the possibility? Because I think it's to that point of boundaries. I mean, they have boundaries not only with what they could not can eat, they had geographic boundaries. They had boundaries with their knowledge, mm. things they didn't even know. They had boundaries in their understanding of how the world works. Like. God makes this beautiful world, sets them in a, a certain boundary, but I think at the same time makes them deeply, deeply curious to wonder what's on the other side of these boundaries. That's why be fruitful, multiply, name the animals, like all these things which would invite one to explore because our faith is not a static faith. It's to your point, Mark. We're, we're growing, we're learning, we're evolving, we're adapting, we're changing, we're wondering, okay, how, how can our relationship with God flourish? Flourish is such an organic term. You said before the, the podcast something about gardening, right? Um, when it comes to the problem of evil and suffering, I think so many times it's in the brokenness that we begin to see the newness of, of life and God's dream for our soul in the midst of this is flourishing. That's why the Bible begins Genesis 2, God breathed on Adam and Eve and they became living souls. And that word living actually means to flourish. It's this beautiful word picture of a, a flower that's blossoming and blooming, it's alive. Um, like we're seeing all around us right now in spring. Um, so I think this is part of, in a sense, this redemptive journey, but we're still in this place between two gardens, but we advocate for the healing. We actually have a motivation to set the world right, rather than just acceptance of, oh, this is how it is, deal with it. Yeah, we have like this human bent to break the yeah. boundaries. There was a recent study, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but and I might botch it, but here's like the summation of it. So they did a bunch of studies of kids who grew up in homes with no boundaries, no rules, no guidance, versus kids who grew up in homes with boundaries, rules, guidance, intentionality. And the kids who grew up in homes where there were rules and boundaries in a healthy way ended up doing much better mm -hmm. later on in life than those uh, who grew up with no boundaries and they felt better, you know, on the mental health well being side. And I think that's really interesting, like how God sets this into play and he says, hey, you know, here's like, there's so much, there's a, there, there's a multitude of things that they got to enjoy, but just one thing, just one boundary that's not good for you because I care about you. And we have this bent to say, no, I want to. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I want to see what's on the other side. Like, mm -hmm. what is that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they're, for them in that moment, um, it's clear. It's, I, I want to be like God. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not happy with the limitations. So I'm going to, I want to go, maybe, maybe if I'm like, I mean, it's the reason we sin. Why do we sin? Because we don't trust that God is really going to give us the pleasure and delight if we don't in the long run. So we take it now and we get the mm -hmm. quick hit and we're not happy with the nature of things. We're not happy that God set up boundaries and things that, you know, G.K. Chesterton said, if you, before you go and take offense down, you might wanna ask the question why it was put up in the first place. And you think about that culturally, we go and do these things because we think it, it, it's what's going to be best. Being like knowledge of good and evil, <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds like some knowledge I should have. Maybe he's not right in telling me I shouldn't have it. Yeah. And so I'll take it and we do it now. We we take shiny things and we take, we do this lust sin and this money sin and we do it all because we're not really sure his advice was right that we shouldn't. Mm. Let's take it. It'll be a good thing for me. Mm. And ultimately that they, they weren't happy being human. They wanted to be God and we do it every day. Yeah. Think, think about that like idea as a parent. Like you're a parent, you've got twins. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the other things about suffering that we think about is if God knew we were going to suffer so much, why did he create us, right? If there's going to be so much suffering. Well, the thing as a parent that you know is I'm going to create these little human beings. I know they're going to experience suffering in their life, but I believe I have the capacity and the power that any suffering they experience, I can help redeem it 
or help them overcome it as a father. And so I know my good, limitations, Jason. that that I have limitations and there are things that I can and cannot do, but I'm still gonna create my children uh, because I believe that I can give them what's best. Yes, they're gonna experience suffering, but they're also gonna experience the other side of suffering, which is joy and mm -hmm. happiness and hope. And you know, they find that in Jesus. So I think when we think about suffering, yes, suffering is, is terrible. And I think God created us in spite of knowing that we're gonna suffer, but then ultimately God knows that he can redeem the suffering, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, he's not limited. He's like, okay, fine. You guys are gonna sin. I'm still gonna create you uh, because I know that I can do something to to fix the issue. Like uh, we are preaching right now uh, in Acts, we're in chapter two, and this verse in verse 23 says this: "This man was handed the." This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Mm. So he's talking about Jesus here and he's saying God had a deliberate plan in place. He had foreknowledge of exactly what was going to happen, yet he created him. Why? Because he knew he had the power to raise him up from the dead. So in suffering, God is like, that is not the end of the story. Mm. I have redemptive value mm. and the ability to redeem anything. So even in the fallen world, yeah. I'm still going to get the ultimate glory and they're still going to be okay on the other end. Yeah. If, That's so good, Jason. To to build on that from the the movie world, there's a movie called Arrival. Brilliant movie, sci-fi movie. Um, and it has a plot that I've never seen play out in movies before. And I'll and I'll take it into rooms sometimes. Spoiler and I'll, alert. And I'll, oh, wow, this is the thing. There is a spoiler, <laughs> spoiler alert for the next minute. Um, but I'll but I'll raise this question almost, and it's almost divided down the line of men and women, but what you just said there made me think of it. Like, so basically the premise of the movie is, um, well, I won't even tell you, but the point of the, 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 the final conclusion is, would you have a child if you knew that at 12 or 13 years old, that kid was going to die? Hmm. That becomes the premise of the movie. For knowledge, you're going to lose the kid, but you get those 12 years. So I've asked rooms of people the question, if you knew... You're 12, is gone. Would you do it? Almost down gender lines. Mm -hmm. Men are like, no, nope. I am not doing it. And women go, yeah, hmm. I want those 12 years of love. Hmm. I want, it's, it's, you know, it's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all, right? It's wow. like, it's that thesis. And that's exactly what I almost, when you were talking, rewired the movie, like this is God creating and the cost benefit ratio is, it's worth it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm all the pain and suffering, all the stuff they're going to do, it's all worth it for the glory on the other side of it or the, even the glory moments during it. Yeah. So I mean, I yeah, Especially that, if you know That's that you, so can, good. you can fix it. That scenario in right. that movie is yes. very morbid because right. I can't do anything. Right. Yes, I get those 12 years, but the rest of my life is miserable because yes. I lost my child. Exactly. So that's why I'm a no. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm an absolute <laughs> no. But, no. The same, but, but if you yeah. think of the same concept, all of us have either, maybe you've purchased a house or you've bought a vehicle. I know when I purchase a house, it's going to have problems. Mm -hmm. But because I know I can repair them, I still buy the house. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that God is the same way. Like, yeah. I'm going to create them. It's going to be fallen and broken, but I can fix it. Yeah. And I mean, that perspective just makes me have confidence yeah. in God that resurrection, you know, is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really, really good. Great story uh, that kind of parallels, you know, what Jason's talking about. I think a couple of highlights. One, God does this places them in the garden, says not to eat of this tree because of obedience. The, the, the willingness and the opportunity to choose obedience to God. I think secondly, there's this idea that uh, love is not love without the freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. So we're not robots, right? God didn't put us in the garden. He's like, you know, do, do a robot thing, Mark. Me, uh, me, uh. Yeah. <laughs> not, that was just on call. Good. That was really I mean, there's no awesome, prep man. for that. We're, yeah, yeah, that I was spent good. a week thinking about. <laughs> sounded like a pig. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not robots. Like we have the freedom to choose to yeah. love and worship God. We're not robot robotically loving and worshiping God. Mm. We're not robotically like teaching the Bible and making disciples. Like we get to choose to do that. And that's a beautiful thing in a relationship. Like, you know, it's that whole thing that we heard growing up you don't you know stand at the altar with your spouse you remember this we heard this over and over again and like put a gun oh yeah, yeah, yeah. to their head and say you have to marry me mm. like that's just so foreign and shocking to us to even hear that because nobody does that well, unless you've what are you, heard what are you, of somebody. What are you, what are you, you guys grow up in a cult? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that thing that Pastor Tony used to say? No, no, no. We go back. Marry we've, me. We've heard all of these uh, right. illustrations. So 
I think those are highlights. And then another one, just to bring to this to surface what you guys are saying, God sees a greater good. Mm. So mm. post-Genesis 3, mm. permeation of human suffering throughout history. And it and God doesn't hide from this reality. Like the Bible vividly describes human suffering mm. and honestly describes it. I know in your book, by the way, such a good book, Problem of God, you talk about how the Bible doesn't shy away from it and how the Bible just brings it to the surface, like yeah. in an honest, open way. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, they say that maybe the first, the oldest book we have in the Bible is Job, mm -hmm. right? So it's the whole question of theodicy and suffering and evil. That's, that's the first thing that the Bible wants to deal with. <laughs> you know, three chapters. It's not like we get 14 chapters of, of, of Eden and then we get the sin and we're like, oh, snap, you get two chapters and then sin and brokenness. So the Bible's just so real. Every prophet you're in, every Psalm you're in, it's like the world sucks. Why does, I love the Psalms that are like, I'm righteous, I love you. That guy over there is a total scumbag <laughs> and his life is flourishing and mine sucks, mm -hmm. right? We've all, we all, we all know like, we all know when that person, you know, the, even this week, just to be dead honest, my wife had a, um, they found a couple of things where they were like, hey, do you, do you have cancer? We brought the kids into it. Like, mm -hmm. and praise God, it, it wasn't the case, but it's like our brains are karmic almost by nature. We're like, well, righteous equals no disease, mm -hmm. you know, unrighteous, they should be poor and miserable. And the people following God's ways should be mm -hmm. flourishing. And then half the Psalms are like, well, that's not the way it is. The world is so random. Ecclesiastes like this this guy cheats on his wife. He's a total loser. He's you know and he's rich and killing it and I'm like the most and my life sucks and I got disease and like what is going on in the universe? Just I love the Bible's reality, the ability to just be gritty and go I just hate how the world is. I hate my enemies. I want to pound their teeth against the rocks and punch their face and like this is the Bible just being real. And I just I just think that's a beautiful thing in a culture that wants authenticity, you find it in the Bible yeah. versus yeah. elsewhere, so. Yeah, people are honest about their struggles. Yeah. They're not like couching it with cliche Christian no. language. No. There's none of that. No. It's like, this sucks, I'm wrestling with you, I'm angry God, like this is really hard and I don't understand that. So yeah. is the option, Genesis 3 starts, God's like, oh, here comes human sin. I know what it's going to do. Let's just wipe out human history. Or does God say, let human history unravel. And in the midst of it, like a parent to a child, I know that there's going to be a greater good of redemption. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that I can, I can, you know, pursue human beings, bring them back into harmony with me of relationship, help them to begin to form their life around my design for the image of God and flourishing and community and friendship and all this stuff. I think God looks at that plan B and plan B is let's not wipe this out. Let's allow it to unfold. And I have greater good, even though there is present pain. And I think that's the storyline of scripture. Like we all suffer. And like you said, Job, Job was the most righteous person on the face of the earth. And he was the most successful. Like, think of that. He's like the business person, the Steve Jobs. Uh, he's the person with all the money, the Elon Musk. And he is a righteous man. And that does not mean that any of us, because we're righteous or we're successful, can evade human suffering. Oh, no. It touches all of our lives. Yeah, it's indiscriminate, right? It's Everybody indiscriminate. experiences suffering, no matter what their background is. Some people to a, more of a degree than others, but it is a universal human experience of suffering because we live in a fallen world. So everybody's going to have to deal with it at some point. Yeah. At some point, someone you know will die. It's a guarantee. And it's yeah. a tough reality, but I think that's where, again, we bring Jesus into the equation. Um, and when you're talking to people, because you're going to, as a pastor, you're going to talk to people who experience suffering. You let them know that redemption is found in Christ. That is where the hope is that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's amazing that God designs his plan. Um, he's the three mile an hour God, right? So we think he should have just, 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 just solved it. And he's got this slow roll. Oh yeah. He's got Noah doing his thing and... <laughs> And then the the Joshua, I want you to go kill all those pagans and take a piece of dirt, and that's going to be important dirt. What? And then 
the Exodus and this is this, this the prophets, Israel, Jesus. It's like, what is all this? And then for Jesus, the whole center of the center of the center of the story to be the man of suffering and sorrows, for suffering to be like um, Jurgen Moltmann talks a lot about this and some of his theology is wonky, but um, he talks about how God is, he's like the, he's the God who identifies, even when he shows up to Moses, he's like, I heard the cries of my people. I'm the God who suffers. And that's actually core. This is what Moltmann says, which I think is so interesting. He doesn't say like suffering is, is kind of something God does. It's something he is. Mm. It's it's actually not just part of his kind of modus operandi. It's actually when he when he explains who he is, suffering. This is who he is. When Jesus Christ shows up, he's the suffering one, and so God has this like this empathy with the world where he's showing up. He's feeling the pain constantly. He's with everybody all the time, and it's just amazing that our most tragic, awful most felt experience is the, is the thing God uses. And this is why Christianity is so universal. Everybody suffers to your point and Jesus himself suffered. It's like, he didn't just give us some rules. And if we follow them one day, we get to go to heaven when we die. Suffering and pain is the center of the center of the whole story. There's no better mm -hmm. solution than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, he is the, he's a man of sorrows. I'm so glad he said that because Jesus defined and really exemplify what it means to walk through seasons of heartache and pain. I was reading John 11 earlier last week and thinking through resurrection and all that for Easter and what Jesus did at the tomb, right? He he knew how the story ended. He knew that resurrection would come. I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? But he still wept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was still messed yes. up inside because yes. of the grief, the right. pain, lament, his friends who are broken. He's devastated in that moment. And I, I think capturing that, as we walk through suffering, we're not just saying, here's a cat poster, it's all gonna end wonderfully, you know, be happy. We're saying, no, this this really stinks. Like this is horrific, what you're going through is hard. Yes. And I think what makes suffering so painful, is not just like, oh yeah, someday I believe in heaven, all that. It's why isn't God showing up right now? Yeah. Right? Why is he allowing this horrific thing to happen to this person yeah. in my life? And he's not intervening, he's not answering my prayers or the silence of God. I mean, that that's a huge one because oftentimes pain strikes us in a sudden way. The silence of God is a glacial, slow type of gnawing pain. And that's the, that's the difficulty. Um, and yet we find there, Maltman, what, what you just shared, Mark, God meets us at the tomb. <laughs> he weeps with us, not in a powerless kind of weakness, like, oh, I don't know how this is going to end. I hope this works out good. Um, but in a in a empathy, and I've been there. I know what you're feeling. And somehow, some way, the price tag of suffering is worth the love that we encounter in the end. Yeah. Uh, I got to drop a name of a theologian just so I can sound like I'm supposed <laughs> to be here. <laughs> I don't know what I'm Because these two are dropping names. <laughs> or, no, nobody's Mo ever heard. Hold on. <laughs> what do you see? Well, anyway, uh, I went to seminary. We didn't read those books. Uh, so there's a, uh, a guy, his name is Os Guinness. You can look him up. He's yeah. maybe Scottish. Yep. So that's close to German. Um, and I was listening to him talk, and he was giving a talk, and he was saying, some t oftentimes when we experience suffering, we think to ourselves, things should not be this way. God, why are you allowing this to happen? Mm -hmm. It should not be this way. And God looks at us and says, it's not the way I intended it. Mm -hmm. And so there's this thing where we experience where God comes alongside us to demonstrate like, hey, I'm with you and in your tears and sorrow, no, this is not what I intended, but this is what we got yeah. and this is how I'll fix it. So suffering, God coming alongside of us and entering into the story, I think also demonstrates his love and care and compassion for us because imagine Adam and Eve sin and they're in the garden and there's no redemption. Right. It's just yeah. constant sorrow yep. forever right. is is yeah. excruciating. And if you read Genesis 3, there was redemption immediately. God pursues them. Yeah. They hide from God. They hide from each other. They try to placate their guilt and shame and anxiety with coverings. And then God says, no, let me make you a covering yeah. that is more durable. That was like, that was the first picture of atonement Mm -hmm. forgiveness, redemption, the pursuit and nature of God, mm -hmm. when we literally do what's opposite yeah. that he told us. And so I think that's a beautiful picture. But Mark, I wanna say like, I love that you pointed out that suffering is the center of the story, mm -hmm. which is so interesting. Like for us, as we wrestle through our human suffering to realize 
Jesus is the ultimate uh, climax of all the promises of the entire Bible. Yeah. Everything from Genesis on points to him, the longings of the human heart, longing for Jesus, and everything from Revelation back is looking you know, back to him and what he did and like what he's going to do moving forward. Let me, and, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. And the center of that story is that God suffered for us, that God saw our suffering and he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like that's a part of his very nature. He was willing to come down and suffer for us so that he could ultimately save us from suffering. To me, that's the ultimate answer. Like. I want to worship and serve a God who looks at my brokenness and humanity and pain and hardship and says, I am, I'm not going to stay in heaven. Like, I'm not going to stay in like the place of opulence and glory and like beauty. I'm going to come to earth where everything is broken and I'm going to experience brokenness mm -hmm. alongside of you. And I'm going in the most beautiful, wise, redemptive way. Talk about God being all knowing. He knew that that suffering would be the very means by which he would rescue all of us and place us into the second garden yeah. in Revelation 21, 22. So I just love that. So, Jason. Uh, let me just pose a question that I often get around this. I'll pose it to y'all. I actually have an answer for it too that I would love to give. So I'm really asking myself the question, but I wanna hear what you guys have to say. <laughs> uh, so, you know, in this second garden, how do we know that sin won't enter in again and we get the same story, like mm -hmm. suffering comes back? Mm -hmm. How do we know that in the second garden, we don't need to be redeemed? What stops people from sinning then that didn't stop Adam and Eve? Yeah. Well, I think uh, it's definitively said there in Revelation 21, I think it's verse three or four, that there's gonna be no more uh, pain and sorrow and so on and so forth. So I think it's it's a definitive like statement mm -hmm. in the end of the story when God renews the heaven and earth or makes it brand new again. Yeah, and kind of like, I nothing. mean, that's such a hard question because behind that is, is there free will? In right. right. So, but, I, but my answer to that, Dominic, yeah. would be all the people that enter the kingdom of God had already chosen mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. follow and worship Jesus. So you're saying there comes a point in the journey where we lock in our yeah. chosenness? Yes. So there's an American theologian his name is Randy Alcorn. <laughs> yes, Randy. He answers, he answers the question this got way. got a thick book on He basically said, Adam and Eve, when so they're in the garden, they're innocent, right? They yes. are, they're innocent. They're not sinless. They're innocent. They haven't entered into the experience. But when we get to that new garden, as you've alluded to, we're righteous. Mm -hmm. So we've received the righteousness of Jesus. So we do what's right. right. And I think that answer, That's when I read that, that like gave me hope like, oh, somebody's not going to mess this whole thing up for us again. Right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because they were innocent. Yeah, but there's a very a yeah. vast difference between being innocent and being righteous, which we receive because of Christ. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. Um, just thinking about this whole thing for people listening or watching that are going through pain and suffering, and why positing God, um, even if you haven't worked out all this stuff or German theologian nonsense, um, there's a, there's something that that having the perspective of God in the midst of your suffering gives you. And I actually thought about what you sent me the other day. I'm writing a <clears throat> chapter right now on death and I was telling Jason about it. And he texted me what um, Jonathan Evans uh, said at his, mm. mo his mother's funeral. Mm. Of course, he was wrestling with God about his mother's death and, uh, you know, kind of saying, God, why would you do this? And why would you take my mom or whatever? And so God gave him, like spoke to him, like clearly. And he said this, number one, you don't understand the nature of my victory because just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean that I haven't already answered your prayer anyway, because victory was already given to your mom. You don't understand because of the victory that I have given you. There was always only two answers to your prayers. Either she was going to be healed or she was going to be healed. Either she was going to live or she was going to live. Either she was going to be with family mm -hmm. or she was going to be with family. Either she was going to be well taken care of or she was going to be well taken care of. Victory belongs to me because what I've already done for you, the two answers to your prayer are yes and yes because victory belongs to yeah. Jesus. Mm. And I just love that yeah. perspective of like, Mm. What you, you were praying that my mom's going to be taken care of. And I answered it because at some point everyone dies, but, but interpreting that as 
my mom's getting taken care of because she's gone to be in a better scenario with God. She's gone to be with family. She's gone to be, mm -hmm. to do all the things that I was praying that she does, but it's in a different perspective because what I meant is keep her on earth to do it. And God's going, no, I've done it in a much bigger yeah. way. You know, yeah. just that whole yeah. perspective mm -hmm. helps. I, I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah no shift. Doubt. Yeah, let's uh, let's end this. So somebody's listening to this and they're wrestling with human suffering and their relationship with God. And maybe they don't have a concept of how God intersects with their suffering, how to bring God into their suffering. Mm -hmm. One just pastoral encouragement from each of us for the person listening that's just struggling with yeah. human suffering. I, I would say that as Jesus as the man of sorrows exemplifies not only what it means to grieve and lament, but also to protest against suffering. Um, we talked about the garden and how in the garden there was a tree of life. In Revelation, there's a tree of life. And when God created the world, it was in the midst of chaos, right? And at the end, when God recreates the world, it's in the midst of chaos. The tree's in the midst of chaos. Jesus, when he died, it says Jesus was the middle tree, right? And surrounding him was chaos. He is the tree of life. He is the one we go to with our grief, our lament, our pain. We find a God who walks with us, who limps with us, who grieves with us, who weeps with us. But this isn't a passive kind of weeping or limping. The redemption we're talking about here is a violent kind of redemption. Um, it is a, a, a redemption that pushes back against evil. And yes, there's an acceptance of there, the ultimate yes, he will restore, renew all things. But it doesn't mean that we live in this place of just simply waiting and enduring. We also ask the question, what are the wounds of our life and this world that most uh, devastate us? And what would it look like to, for us to be a healing presence there? What are the things that most have wounded us and how can we be those who love those who are in the midst of that, right? It's the fellowship of suffering that Paul spoke about. So I would want to ask the question, how can our pain be used for redemption for others in this fallen world that we live, yeah. knowing that we carry with us the scars of the crucified one? Love that. By violent redemption? maybe. By violence, I mean a, a kind of redemption that pushes back actively. Okay. Yeah, so we're like on against the Against the chaos, we're on we the offense. And, and that's that's what Jesus song. did. That's what the man of sorrows did. He wasn't just weeping, crying through life, but it was he, he when he saw a storm, he rebukes mm -hmm. the storm. When he sees leprosy, he touches the leper. Mm. Uh, he's active, right? And redemption is always proactive. It's violent in that sense of it it takes the offense. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. what we're called to do. Well, as uh, the German theologian Jason Kane said, um, <laughs> that's good. Um, I would say, to be honest, what does the fall story teach us? If you're if you're looking for like principles, um, and you're suffering through pain and, and agony, um, it teaches us to not try to be God. Hmm. And I think the the quicker you stop trying to be God. Uh, in the midst of your pain and suffering, and you decide to be creature, not creator, uh, I think you're gonna more healthily move forward in the world. So what does that mean? It means you humbly go, okay, maybe I should start praying um, because there's only somebody bigger than me that can help me. Maybe it is that you become part of a community of people where you go surround yourself with people who might serve you and love you. I know one person um, I talked to, his, his wife was, um, suffering with cancer and he said one of the hardest things about it is your whole church wants to love on you and you, but you got to be on it's exhausting because then when they show up they throw all their stuff on you my my aunt had the same kit and all of a sudden you're pastoring everybody but there's a beauty to it too all these people they're leaning in they just want to love you hmm. and so now you're humbling yourself even though it's harder to go i need people I need people, I need God, I need prayer, I need, I need, I need. That's the whole principle, the whole story is stop acting like you don't need. And in the midst of your moment of pain and suffering, almost admit the nature of things, admit that creation kicks back, admit you are just a creature that needs. Mm. And in that needing, you're gonna get healing, mm. you know, emotionally, you know, physical, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Really I guess on a practical it. sense, if you're still watching the podcast at this point in time, I think you have some interest or curiosity yes. about faith. Yeah. And so lean into that. 
right? Like find a faith community, mm -hmm. read books. And I also believe in playing the long game. There are people who have been wrestling with God their entire lives before they can make a definitive decision. Like I, I know. So I would say just have curiosity uh, to explore the faith and to not, you know, get get rid of it just because it, it wasn't the tradition that you grew up in or something to that, to that effect but just be willing to explore. I mean, think about the disciples. Peter's with Jesus for three years. Jesus is going to the cross. Peter denies him three times. Mm -hmm. And Jesus let Peter walk with him for three years when Peter did not necessarily have the faith that you would believe that we would need to follow Jesus. So I think Jesus offers us this opportunity to follow him before we even believe. Uh, so pick up the book and read it and and see where, where it leads you. Yeah. I think my final word is... I think all all the my I feel like part of my, the storyline of my life is that God has allowed a lot of suffering, and when I was not a follower of Jesus and suffering, there there was a void uh, of relational help, and now that I'm a follower of Jesus and I've walked through some really really hard things in my adult life, you know, there's this saying. I would rather suffer with God than without God. And I have found that to be so true. And that doesn't mean that it's not hard. In the present, it is painful and it's disorienting and it disturbs your life and it it elicits questions like about faith and God and you know righteousness and reward and all of this stuff that we talked about. But the beautiful thing that I've learned is that God is so near to people who suffer. Like He's an ever present help in time of need. And any time that you or I are walking through a really painful, confusing season that has disrupted our life and we just don't understand, I want you to know that there is a God who understands to a depth that no human will ever understand. He knows pain at a level that nobody in human history understands because he suffered to an extent that is far greater than all of us. And he doesn't just speak that over you. He actually enters into your pain like you talked about. And so I just want to encourage you to let God in the nitty gritty challenges of human pain to be a support and a help through every season. Like I have found God to be more real in my life through the darkest days of depression and anxiety and you know, family illness, uh, serious family illness. I've found God to be more real and more true in those moments than in any other moment of my life. So God is with you and he is near and he cares about every ounce of pain that you walk through. So although we have hope that mm -hmm. in the future, we're gonna be in a better world in a better place and we still long for that, we crave that in our soul. It's an innate human longing. Right now, in the midst of this in-betweenness, you have a God who cares and is with you. So thank you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank Obviously you. listening well through this, everybody knows you guys are absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being on this episode and uh, Google this guy, Dominic Doan, Google this guy, Mark Clark. Look me up on Instagram. Don't, don't Look don't this Google guy me. up on <laughs> Instagram. He's got the best Instagram <laughs> oh, yeah. ever. Yeah. And uh, love you guys. So thankful for you. you too. Great job, bud. <laughs>